watch it. Oh, there you go. And then we didn't watch any movies or anything, but we had fun. So. We just sat around and talked. For a I'm going to go get water. Can you get water? No, I Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you. Would you stand with us as we prepare our hearts for our time of worship? Merry Christmas to everyone again. Merry Christmas to you all. And we are, uh, I encourage you to take a uh, bulletin out and turn to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm 8, if you've got the bulletin, we're there uh, with it as well for our scripture reading. We're going to read the scripture together, and then I will pray, and then we're going to launch into our uh, worship uh, through music today. So Psalm 8, verses 1 through 4, let's read these verses together. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather together today and worship you. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are mindful of us, that you do care for every single one of us. So Lord, we give praise for you for that fact. So as we worship together, Lord, may you guide and direct our hearts in praise. May we focus on your word today. May we understand that you, your intent is for us to be ruling with your son, to reign with him. Lord, how incredible and how majestic is that, that that is your intent for us. So we celebrate that today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Thank you. 
Uh, one of the reasons that we picked this song this week is because it lyrically fits right in with where we're at in Hebrews chapter 2. So one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do as we sing the song to really pay attention to the lyrics of the song, as we should always, but pay attention specifically to this one. You may want to take that lyric sheet out that's in your bulletin. And also during the sermon, you can keep that lyric sheet out and look at the song and go, aha, that's where that came from in this song. So it's just something I want you to pay attention to as we go through this. It's a song that we know well, but this song is rooted in the book of Hebrews. Okay, so let's sing together. watching online even right now and so uh, we're going to do this I have to set up in a spot where they can see me here and uh, we are talking about this guy today this guy um, this guy's name Sam I'm sure you knew that by the picture yes <laughs> this guy is named Samuel and essentially what we're talking about today kids is the heart that follows God the heart that follows God. And there was Samuel, and 
you can ask later on Thursday night and different times like that when we have our kids' time. But Samuel uh, was one of the judges in the Old Testament. And one of the, the judges were around because, well, unfortunately, God's people didn't follow God as king many times. And they sinned. And we all sin and fall short of what God has called us to be in our lives. And so Samuel was one of them. And Samuel's sons even went their own way. And uh, it was, you know, that's just unfortunately what was happening. And what was happening during Samuel's life was that the people were coming to him and they were saying, Samuel, Samuel, we want a king. Like the rest of these nations around us, we want a king. And they didn't understand that their nation had a different purpose than any other nation on the planet. The Israel, the nation of Israel was for God and for God's glory. But now they were looking around and going and looking at all of the other countries around them and go, hey, they've all got kings. And so we want to be like them instead of being like how God told us to be. And what happens sometimes in our own lives is that God has told us to be a certain way. And then we take a look around and see what people are doing that are different than what God says. And you know what we end up doing? We end up following them instead of God. And so it's very similar to what was going on here. So God tells Samuel, when Samuel was praying to him, to warn the people of Israel what it would be like if they had a king. He's like, I don't want that. You don't want that. That's, I'm your king. You don't want that. But God told Samuel that, okay, if they want a king, we will give them a king. And that is what happened. And then we had, I have to get to the right page there. Then we have a guy named Saul who was chosen king. And Saul was a servant searching for his father's donkeys when he became king. And Samuel called the people together and they anointed Saul the king. And the people thought they got what they wanted. They thought they got what they wanted. And Samuel meets Saul and they end up making him king. And you know what happens as soon as he becomes king? A war starts. A war starts. The Philistines start a war and the Israelites were outnumbered and they were hiding in caves and King Saul couldn't attack the Philistines until Samuel came and he wasn't supposed to do anything until Samuel got there. But Saul got, what? He got, he's like, I can't wait any longer. I don't want to wait. I'm going to do this my own way. And Saul took matters in his own hands and he offered a sacrifice to God that only Samuel was supposed to do. So Saul ended up doing that himself. And guess what happened? Good old Samuel shows up and says, whoa, whoa, you weren't supposed to do that. What did Saul do? He did things his own way not God's way. And when, and this is what we all need to learn, when you are tempted to do things your own way instead of what God says, you sin. And there's a punishment for sin. Do any of you know what Saul's punishment was? Go ahead, you can shout it out if you know. Death. His line wasn't going to be allowed to be king anymore. He lost the privilege of being the line that uh, was king. 
And what happens when we sin? We lose the privilege of being with God. Now, Saul made all types of excuses for why he did the sacrifice. And isn't that the same with us? We make all types of excuses of why we don't follow God sometimes. It's like, well, you know, you know, it'd be a lot easier if we didn't have to do it that way or it just felt right or anything like that. But that is not what we're called to do. And so Samuel declared that Saul was no longer going to be able to be the king and his family be the king after his death. And that was the end of that. And what we want everyone to know in this story is that will you actually follow God and follow his word and let God be king? Let God be king of your heart. And the reason that we do that is we let Jesus be our Lord and Savior because he forgives our sins so that we can be with God. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to take a look at our hearts and make sure to know that we need to follow your way and not our way. So, Lord, give us the strength and the courage to follow you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, everyone. A few announcements for you uh, before we go any further in the uh, service this morning. First of all, uh, Thursday night is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so Thursday night, we are going to be back here at 7 o'clock. And if you, if anyone know what Thursday night is, it is New Year's Eve. Yes. And we are going to have our normal Thursday night, but we're going we're gonna to amp it up. We're going to have a lot of fun with it. So Thursday night at 7 o'clock, we're going to have our whole worship team. And what's fun is that most of our worship team is back next Thursday, uh, back from uh, all of our college age that, and young adults that are gone right now because they're off in places uh, that I'm not going to disclose online. Um, but uh, they're off and about. Uh, one of the things that uh, they're going to all be back and we are going to uh, have our, our full worship time together uh, on Thursday night. And then we're starting a new series in the book of Deuteronomy about being equipped to follow God. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a great way to start the new year off right. Worshiping together, uh, being equipped in God's word uh, to live for him uh, for 2021. So that's what's coming up on Thursday night. Before we even get to that, though, tomorrow night is our annual meeting for all of our members, regular attenders uh, here in this room at uh, 7 o'clock. Now, you don't have to be a member to come to that and to hear what our plans are and what everything looks like. But as far as voting on our budget and then voting to approve our deacons and our elders, those are, that's a membership only part of it. But everything else you get to hear about. And so that's Monday night, 7 o'clock. We'd prefer for you to be here if you can. Uh, we will provide a link to, to have it on Zoom as well. We cannot do a live version on any of the other platforms. But what we will do is we will record it and then do a private link on our Vimeo page later that night if you can't watch it on Zoom. But uh, there's not a, we don't have the capability of doing live um, private uh, on any of our other channels. So uh, it'll be on Zoom uh, and then it'll be recorded later. Uh, and that's a private link that we'll email, email out to members and regular attenders. Okay, so that's what's going on. And then, guys, uh, Saturday morning at 7 o'clock, we have our men's workshop as well. 7, 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we'll have uh, the donuts and coffee and all of the fun stuff, and we open God's Word uh, at that time. Okay, so sounds good. As we get ready for our message, a few reminders. First of all, take that bulletin out. And in your bulletin, you'll see the outline for today's service. So I encourage for you to uh, have that outline ready as we uh, end up uh, in the book of Hebrews here in just a second. But also in the bulletin is the Connect card. Want to make sure you fill the Connect card out. Let us know that you're here and any prayer requests that you may have. 
So please fill that out and let us know. And then at the end of the service, there's a box at the back door there for the connect cards. And then, of course, uh, offering. And we need to remember that as well. So uh, there's offering envelopes for those that are here in the seat backs in front of you. You can put your offering in there and then put it into the offering box in the back before you leave. And then you can also give online as well, as many people do. And you can also uh, send a check in uh, via mail. So we've got all three types of uh, giving that you can do there. In person here uh, with the check uh, in the mail and then online giving uh, that's secure as well. So please remember to participate in the offering. And let's get our Bibles out and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And if you do not have a Bible with you. There are Bibles in the back, and you can get one back there. Uh, Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 9. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been just testified somewhere, quote, What is man that you are mindful of him? or the son of man that you care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while. While he was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that the grace of God, he, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Let's pray together. Lord, as we open your word, as we study your word, as we apply your word to our lives this morning, may we understand how much you love us how Jesus is greater, how Jesus is the founder of our salvation. Lord, thank you for this teaching that we will have today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a little axiom that I was taught a long time ago about preaching. You want to hear what it is? Here it is. Here it is. It goes like this. The job of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and what? Afflict the comfortable, all right? Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable and somehow do it all in the same time. And it's really good advice when you think about it because a preacher needs to give both of those things for people coming in and listening to God's word for a balanced ministry. And this actually summarizes the task of the writer of the letter of Hebrews as he saw it. For his emphasis alternates between extended passages of comfort and brief sections of affliction or disturbing appeals throughout this entire book. So, so far, he has comforted the afflicted in the storm-tossed little church with a, with a ranging summary of the superiority of Christ in chapter 1 that asserts his prophetic and cosmic and, and priestly and angelic supremacy. This grand vision of Christ was meant to be, what? A firm anchor in the storms of persecution that these believers were going through. Likewise, in the beginning of chapter 2, in the first four verses that we looked at last week, he has afflicted the comfortable. Comfortable. He said, whoa, don't let those anchors go up. Don't, what did he say last week? Don't drift. You drift from Christ. Don't do that. And he was issuing a challenge that contained a, a ringing warning to it. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? And so just right there, just 
45, 50 seconds and summarizing. We have comforting the afflicted and then taking those that are too comfortable and pounding on them and afflicting them and saying, don't get comfortable. Have you noticed that this year, as far as Christians are concerned, I think this year's really good at pounding us and saying, don't get comfortable. Right? Don't get comfortable in this world. Don't let that anchor go up and drift with the world because you're going to end up in a place you don't want to be, a place without Christ. Now, in the passage that's before us this morning, the emphasis returns back then to comforting the afflicted. And I think this is a great spot for us to be on this last Sunday of the year and looking forward to 2021. Because as we realize that the smallness of the amount of believers that were there around them in, in, in Rome, in the Rome area, the hostile seas around them, the mounting, as if we're going to continue with the ocean mindset here, the mounting breakers of Nero's persecution that was coming and was starting to be felt. You can imagine how these believers were feeling lonely, how they were feeling insignificant. They were feeling like a, a forgotten cork in the tide of a humongous ocean. And this seeming insignificance is countered by what the writer tells us in verses 5 through 9. As he shows how Christ, through his superiority, gives these people that are feeling so insignificant how Christ gives them massive significance in his ultimate intention for them. So the author introduces the subject of the ultimate, ultimate intention for believers with a reference to the biblical reality that angels co-minister the present world under God's direction. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, which would mean what? That right now, the angels are doing work. Right now. So the author introduces the subject and the vision behind this, if we were to understand what the Jewish believers were thinking, well, they would immediately trip right back to Genesis 28, verses 10 through 17, because Jacob had a vision. Jacob's ladder. What was that all about? He looked at a ladder and he saw angels doing what? They're coming up and down. They're coming up and down. They're doing work. The angels were co-ministering under the present world, under God's direction. And angels are ministering today. There's angels among us. There are, and remember, they're not dead people. <laughs> I'll take all of the incorrect angel thoughts and toss them. Angels are created by God. They're not dead people that become angels. Dead people are dead people and they're either in hell or in heaven. So anyway, but the message here is clear. There is an angelic commerce between heaven and earth on behalf of God's people. And apparently the administration is organized so much. When we think about it, we see it around scripture. You've got the archangel Michael presiding um, over ordered ranks of angels who are administering God's will. They're combating evil spirits. We see that in Daniel and in Ephesians. And so amazing and so significant in the angel's administration that one would expect, actually, that, well, that they would be administering God's will the rest of the time through the ages, too, of God's kingdom. That they will be doing this the whole time in God's kingdom. But that is not the case, is it? 
Because verse 5 says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. See, that answer is going to come as a surprise for those that read on. Who is God going to use? Man. God's ultimate intention is to have his kingdom rule by redeemed people. Those insignificant people sitting in this little church in Rome that are starting to be persecuted and feel like, hey, I'm one in a million. I'm a minuscule dot in the Roman Empire. The writer saying, oh, no, no. As a redeemed person through Christ, you are going to rule everything. And that leads us back to the original intent of what man was about to begin with. The author establishes this ultimate intention by going and getting us into the fact of what the original intent for God's humanity was and is. And his proof that he's using there is from the middle of Psalm 8. That Psalm 8 celebrates God's original intention for man. And he recites that in verse 6 through 8 for us. It has been testified somewhere. <laughs> somewhere would be Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You may want to just remember that phrase, son of man. Just hold on to that phrase for a moment. That you care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. This is an incredible declaration of God's intention. And it can only be appreciated in the full context of Psalm 8. The psalmist is contemplating the mighty expanse of the evening sky and studded with spheres of light and, and like us going, wow, there's two planets that are coming together. And, you know, we're calling this the Christmas star this last week. You, you know, all of this that's been going on and people are out and about and telescopes out in, uh, out in streets and everything, which can't see a thing because of all the lights that from our area. But... You sit there and people are looking up in the sky and that is what the psalmist is doing in Psalm 8. He's overwhelmed with the greatness of God that he bursts into song, celebrating first God's majestic name, then declaring God's worthiness of praise, and then next wondering at God's intention for puny little man in the midst of that song. You know, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him rule over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. The psalmist is completely astonished at God's original intention for man and this intention was not new because it was originally spelled out for us in the book of Genesis in chapter 1 verses 26 through 28 then God said let us make man in our image in our likeness and let them rule over the fish and the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is why it's so important for us to piece all of these things together and know 
scripture to understand what's happening in Hebrews chapter 2. God's original intention for his people is astonishing, especially with what we know about creation today. The psalmist, when he was looking up, could only see a hint of the vastness and glory of the universe. But through modern technology, we see our planet spinning around the sun, which is one of 100,000 million suns in our galaxy, which is one of 100,000 million galaxies. No wonder there's this astonishing exclamation. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Think of man's astonishing position. And that's why you've got people searching all day, all night with, with huge radio scopes and things like that that just cannot fathom how in the world are we it? Right? How in the world, in all the vastness of the galaxy, are we it? And I sit there and go, well, Scripture says the exact same thing. What is man that you are mindful of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. So the writer is saying puny, puny little man here in Psalm 8, puny little man is only a little lower than the angels. And man, we're in our physical body and the angels are not in a physical body. Man is limited in ways angels are not and man obviously has lesser power but man is not lower spiritually or in importance it's an astonishing position for a temporary little speck in the universe me you think of man's astonishing honor what does it say in psalm 8 there you crowned him with glory and honor. Adam and Eve were the king and queen of the original creation. God sent them into a glorious paradise and walked with them. And consider, as it says there in Genesis, man's amazing authority. You put everything, not some things, you put everything under his feet. This was given to, to mankind through Adam. Man was given rule over the world. Adam and Eve were God's king and queen with the responsibility of ordering creation under the lordship of God. Poetically speaking, Adam was a creature with all things put in subjection to him, wearing the very sun as a diadem, treading the very stars like unconsidered dust beneath his feet. See, the original intent of God, to say the least, was incredible. And if that intention had been carried out, we as descendants of Adam would be living with Adam and Eve right now in the same astonishing position of honor and authority and being a world full of kings and queens. And the implicit message to this little church found in the midst of persecution is that we may feel ourselves insignificant, but oh no, we are not. We are made in God's image. And he cares for every single one of us. And so this intent, original intent, becomes stalled. It's halted. Something went wrong. And the writer purposely gives a dramatic expression by using a double negative in his comment on Psalm on the psalm in verse 8. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. There is nothing, he says, in the world that is not under man's dominion. Nothing. And 
And what the author is trying to get us to do very well is going, time out. That's bogus. That's not true. And then he verbalizes it for us. At present, we do not see everything subject to him, right? You bet your life we don't see it subject to him, us. We have a serious problem here. It's obvious that man today is not exercising dominion over creation. We do not control fish. We do not control fowl. We do not control animals. In fact, man has a hard time controlling himself. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Adam sinned. And as a consequence, his God-given dominion became twisted. Man's rule over creation has through the centuries diminished even further into a complete disaster. Man's rule over the animal kingdom is very superficial. Let's be honest about that. Man achieves the rule over the animal kingdom only by intimidation right now. Obey me or I will eat you or wear you. That is, that's, that's where it's at. And then sometimes we find ourselves being the feast. You see, the problem is, is that man cannot rule over himself, let alone others, because of corruption. We're corrupt. We're sinners. And then that old axiom, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's lived out before our eyes in every generation. We've got a state government led by that. Led by that thought. It's just corrupted. It's wrong. Chesterton was correct when he said, whatever is or is not true about men, this one thing is certain. Man is not what he was meant to be. The intent, the original intent of what man was supposed to be with dominion and power and ruling over God's creation had been halted due to sin. The ultimate intent, though, was found behind that. And you have to ask the question, will man's original intent ever be achieved? Will God's plan for man ever be achieved? And the answer, hopefully you know this, is a resounding yes. And that yes echoes for all eternity. And this is where our section of scripture this morning takes us turn between verses 8 and 9. Catch what it says. We do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while while he was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone. Yet at present we do not see everything subjected to him, but we see we do see Jesus. Here's what's going on. Not only is God's original intention achieved, but his ultimate intention, intention is achieved by one thing and one thing only. Christ. The second Adam. And we have to understand that Psalm 8 was not only a celebration of the significance of man in the vast cosmos and the writer going, how... How in the world am I significant to God in the midst of all of this? It was also a messianic psalm that had its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. We know this because of the term son of man. In the Old Testament, 
all son of man meant originally was man. Thus how we get to, we understand that this is about us and it's about Jesus. Because in the New Testament, what does Jesus call himself? Son of man. The advent of Christ, son of man becomes a messianic reference to Jesus. He repeatedly called himself son of man. What does that mean? He's the son of man, un unrivaled. He's, he's second to none. He's without equal. He's unsurpassed. He's unsurpassable. He's peerless. He's matchless. He's unparalleled. He's unbeaten. He's unbeatable and fulfills everything the psalm celebrates regarding man. He is the son of man. And this initial phrase in verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, was fulfilled in what we just celebrated in Christmas, the incarnation. And what's interesting is that the height of exaltation for man is what, according to this? Being made just a little bit lower than the angels. That's our height. What was Jesus' depth? Or his humiliation be made just a little lower than the angels. Jesus stooped to reach down to the heights of men's glory. Him coming as a man is as low as it can go for Jesus. Interestingly enough, when we see the word Jesus here in verse 9, that is the first use of his name in the book of Hebrews. And it's an emphatic word, stressing his humanity, stressing his work of salvation. It is the name given to him at his birth, and it means the Lord is salvation. The Lord is salvation. That next phrase that we see there, but we see Jesus. How do we see him? Crowned with glory and honor. That was fulfilled, as verse 9 goes on to say, how? Because of the suffering of death. Paul put it this way in Philippians 2, verses 8 through 10. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. So we see that in Christ, man's glorious potential is finally realized. Everything was put under his feet. And as we look around, we certainly see that everything is not subject to man yet. But when we do look around, what do we see as we see here in Hebrews? We see Jesus exalted. And all of creation is subject to him. And with this, the possibility then of man's fulfilling God's ultimate intention is made possible. Christ's glorification is our foretold position in glory. And the way this happens is revealed in the final phrase of verse 9. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The word taste there is very interesting. For us, in our understanding of the word taste right now, well, I'll take a taste of that a little bit, right? <laughs> Spicy, awesome. I'll take a taste of that. That is not what that word meant, okay? It is a Hebrew metaphor. Obviously, it's a Greek word here, but a Hebrew metaphor that does not mean to sample. The word means to partake fully. He fully partake of what? Death. Jesus' real death. 
You know, there's people out there that say that Jesus kind of just faked the death. Didn't really happen. So they can say that he didn't really raise from the dead because they think that that's impossible. Because they don't believe in miracles. And what is the writer saying here? Oh no, he died. He fully died. Jesus' real death for us secured our reign. As Paul explains in Romans, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, expands the idea of reigning with him as he says, and God raised up with Christ, raised us up with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. How in all the universe you look at me and say I'm significant. Remember that's what Psalm 8 was saying? And what is Paul saying? That in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace because we have been redeemed. Because of the fact that we have bowed our knee to Jesus and believe in him and to understand what he has, has done for us. When that happens, our unity with Christ is so close that it's described 169 times by Paul as what? We are found in Christ. We're not by him. He's not my best bud. He's not my co-pilot. I hate that bumper sticker. Jesus is not supposed to be the co-pilot. He's the pilot. And we are what? In him. We are in him. So destroy that bumper sticker if you have it. All right? I'm just saying. Paul obviously wants us to get that idea in his letters when, like I said, 169 times in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. That term suggests an exchange, doesn't it? We have been put into him. By what? An impartation from Christ into us. Being in Christ, the redeemed are so united with him that we share what? the glory and the dominion of his reign. We are co-heirs with Christ. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while, while he was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone. This is the writer comforting the afflicted. This beleaguered little church and the illusion of insignificance that it probably wrapped its fingers around their hearts 
was not where they were supposed to be. They, they probably felt, once again, like an unwanted speck among the millions of the Roman Empire. Who would ever have thought, but it's come to this, that in the United States, as Christians, you really feel, if you believe in the Bible and you're living out God's word, you really feel in the United States now that we are an unwanted little speck in this country. Doesn't it feel like that? Yes. So this message is just as much for us today as it was for them in the Roman Empire then. Because the insignificance is an illusion from the evil one. The reality is that, yes, you are a sub-microscopic spot in a huge, huge galaxy. In a huge, fallen universe. But as God's children, you are... Something different. You are the object of his attention. And once again, to think for even a moment that God is minutely mindful of me and cares about me in greatest detail blows my mind. And not only that, the ultimate intention is not that he's just mindful of me. It's that no angel will ever attain what God has called us to attain as believers. To rule the world to come. No Roman emperor in all of his glory, no corrupt governor could experience a fraction of the glorious reign that will be ours. And moreover, the reign has already begun. Even if you feel insignificant now, the reign has already begun. Why? Because we are in Christ. And Christ on the cross is the measure of their worth, as the writer is letting them know, and is the measure of our worth. Christ on the throne is a prophecy of that Roman church's significance and sure dominion and ours as believers as well. This is meant to comfort us today. I don't know, it may have been a while for you, but if you journey into downtown L.A. and walk through the maze of skyscrapers, or if you kind of zoom out on the map, on the software, and go, good grief, the L.A. basin is 400 square miles with 80 cities in it. And you kind of go, I'm, I live in that. I'm like a gnat in the midst of all of that. There's 12,447,000 people in the LA Basin, and I am one. And yeah, you know what? My comings and goings mean very little to the city of Los Angeles or any other major city for that matter in the scheme of things, if you put it that way but not according to God. Not according to the writer of Hebrews. You see, on God's authority of his word, you are important and of infinite value. You are just a little lower than the angels. And you, as a redeemed believer, will be crowned with glory and honor and everything will be put under your feet. And you may say, like verse 9 says, between verse 8 and 9, 
How can this be? I don't see it. I'm going to walk out of these doors in a few moments and I will not feel like I am raining. Focus in on what it says there. But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor. And according to scripture, I am unified in him. I am in Christ. What is the writer of Hebrews saying to me, is saying to you, was saying to them, Jesus is our promise. He is God's ultimate intention for us. Jesus was the plan and is the plan. And when you say yes to Jesus, you can truly say, I'm in Christ. And I will reign and rule in him forever. That's pretty awesome. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this section of scripture that explains who the founder of salvation is, and that is Jesus, and that he died for us, and that he rose again, and that he has made us one in him, and that we will rule and reign with him forever. Lord, we thank you for that incredible word. Lord, may we never, ever feel ourselves insignificant. And if we ever do, we should go back to this section of Scripture. Lord, remind us of this. Remind us of Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him? Well, what we are is your people that you paid a dear price for. You gave your son for us. So Lord, we are blown away. So Lord, we thank you for that fact. And I pray right now that if there's anyone here today that needs to commit their lives to you, to recommit their lives to you, that they'll come and talk to one of us up front or they'll um, call us and, and talk to us if they're watching us online so that we can have a discussion on what your intent is and how to attain that through Christ. So Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for this great reminder of what you have done for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, just quick reminders, uh, offering box is in the back there, and you can put your offering in there or give online today. Uh, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, is the annual meeting, and that's going to be really important, everyone, because uh, we got a big old hole in our budget this year because of uh, the preschool not paying cut for this coming year, and we got to explain how we're going to get through that. That's a third of our budget that's gone in uh, 2021, and so we're going to uh, be explaining a, uh, a thing that we're going to do this next year called Bridging the Gap as we uh, get through this next year and, and to what we believe that God wants us to do and be uh, beyond that. So it's going to be an important night to be together, so I encourage you to be here for that even if you're not a member. And then Thursday night, New Year's Eve, uh, we are going to have a great time of worship together and teaching and uh, start the new year off right. And no, we will not be going until midnight. So I'm just going to let you know that right now. So anyway, uh, but it's going to be a great time together. And uh, all of that is uh, just happening over the next few days. So it's going to be a lot of a lot of fun. Uh, I'll be up front if you need to talk with me or one of our elders. Uh, uh, Kirk there is in the back and he's available. And uh, if you have any questions about anything, we'll be here for a while. Hang out for a while. Uh, talk with people. See how things are going. See how Christmas went. And uh, what's the plans for the next few uh, days and weeks for everyone. It is uh, great to have you here. And once again, as we leave this room, may you uh, remember that uh, God has his eyes on you and provided Christ for you. And that you are, uh, you are very, very much loved by him. 
that he gave his son to die for you. And that we need to share that with this world that's desperately looking for significance. The only significance that is real is in Christ. Amen? Amen. God bless everyone. Have a great week. That's all right.